Hello, I'm Hania Salah, Deputy Director at the Columbia Global Center in Amman. Thank you for joining us for a virtual panel discussion on Syrian refugee women navigating work in protracted crisis. This discussion is part of a series of events planned by the Network of Columbia Global Centers for Women's History Month on some of the issues confronting women around the world. Today's webinar, organized in partnership with CARE, will offer perspectives and shed light on employment issues facing refu Syrian refugee women in the, in the MENA region. As many of you know, CARE is an international humanitarian organization delivering emergency relief and long-term development projects. CARE works with refugees and host communities with a particular focus on women, girls, and vulnerable families. It has now been 11 years since the start of the Syrian crisis, and many of those displaced in neighboring countries are still in need of humanitarian assistance. The impact of the pandemic and increasing poverty has made the situation even more challenging, especially for Syrian refugee women and female heads of households whose participation in the labor market is low. Although host governments are applying efforts to expand refugees' access to the labor market and humanitarian agencies are offering a range of initiatives to enhance access to livelihood opportunities for Syrian refugee women, there are ongoing challenges. These challenges include policies that often limit the sectors in which refugees are allowed to work in, linking training to work opportunities, as well as challenges concerning mobility and transportation and cultural expectations in relation to gender norms. Ensuring that refugees have access to livelihoods is a crucial stepping stone to support resilience and self-reliance. Through, through today's discussion, we aim to gain a deeper understanding of the livelihood situation of Syrian refugee women and how to include them more actively in processes affecting live, their livelihoods. What policymakers can do and should do to facilitate women's access to employment in the region and the programs and policy shifts that are required. We are pleased to have with us today experts from the humanitarian sector and academia to offer their experiences and perspectives. I would now like to hand over to Professor Monette Zard, who will introduce our speaker and speakers and serve as our moderator for this conversation. Professor Zard is the Alan Rosenfield Associate Professor of Forced Migration and Health at Columbia University and Director of the Program on Forced Migration and Health and a member of the Faculty Advisory Committee for the Amman Global Center. Monette has also served as the Global Human Rights Program Officer at the Ford Foundation in New York and as a Research Director at the International Council on Human, on human Rights Policy in Geneva. She has consulted on international human rights and forced migration issues for several organizations, including Amnesty International, the Brookings Institute, Human Rights Watch, and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Thank you again to everyone in our virtual audience for being with us. We encourage you to send in your questions through the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. We will address them in the latter half of this webinar. Please join me in welcoming Professor Monette Zard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hania, for that kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, wherever to the audience. Um, so welcome to today's panel. Um, as Hania indicated, in this, the 11th year of the Syria crisis, our conversation today will focus on how Syrian refugee women uh, in the MENA region are navigating work and the livelihood space, what lessons we've learned over the course of this crisis, and what challenges remain and how to meet them. Now, we know that access to livelihood is an important pathway to promoting self -sufficient. The right to work is fundamental to the dignity, survival, and security of refugees. And it is a right that is protected under international human rights law. Promoting self a profoundly pragmatic position for both national governments and international donors, given the potential economic contribution of the refugee workforce to local economies, and the fact that international and humanitarian and development aid budgets are finite, and that the attention span of the international community is unfortunately limited. But the refugee livelihoods discussion in the MENA region needs to be situated against a backdrop of high unemployment, 
particularly youth unemployment in many of the hosting countries, and a challenge economic look made worse by the COVID pandemic. In women, we all need to bear in mind even prior to the conflict, Syrian women had low workforce participation rate of 13%, according to the ILO, and an unemployment rate of 22%. Intensified both the need and the willingness on the part of women to work and to earn an income, particularly given the prevalence of female headed households among refugee communities. On a positive note, the MENA region has seen a lot of innovation and creativity in crafting solutions to fostering economic inclusion of refugees and generating livelihood opportunities. In both Turkey and Jordan, we've seen moves towards including refugees in the formal labor market through issuing refugees work permits. The 2016 Jordan Compact, for example, saw the government pledge to provide 200,000 work permits to Syrian refugees in in other humanitarian response permits being issued, an estimated 62,000 last year, although that was a record number. Um, and there are numerous reasons for this. I think as Hanya alluded to, while there's been some expansion in the number of sectors included in the work permits, the employment of non-Jordanians, for example, is still limited to a number of primarily low-skilled occupations and sectors, primarily in the construction, agriculture, manufacturing, and service. And there are, of course, gendered implications that flow from that as the uh, professions that generally attract women. And the list of closed professions actually expanded in 2020 to include vocations such as hairdressing, which have been a traditional focus of job training program. Professions of healthcare, teaching, and business have remained largely off limits to refugees. Although, again, um, because of the pandemic, uh, to grant some exemptions for healthcare workers last year. There are other barriers as well. There are unwieldy procedures, lack of information, and fees, which all together conspire to exclude refugees from the formal workforce. Also face barriers to work um, alluded to, really areas relating to the lack of accessible and affordable transportation, issues to do with family obligations and childcare, and work environments that need to be culturally sensitive. Home-based businesses have been promoted as a method of increasing women's participation in the labor force. However, here again, we see limitations in the number of sectors covered, complex licensing requirements and prohibitive registration costs, which serve as, as significant barriers for women. Um, and then finally, let me just say that there is a diverse and a dynamic set of educational training programs which are on offer throughout the region. But again, making sure that training is attuned to the needs of the labor market uh, continues to be something of a challenge. So against this backdrop, our distinguished panel today will help us probe and understand the strategy that have been used to enhance women's participation in the work, the barriers that remain, and the opportunities that are out there to really realize the full potential uh, of refugee women to contribute to the livelihood of their families and to the economy as a whole. So our first panelist is Carolyn Ennis who is the deputy uh, representative to UNHCR in Jordan. Since joining the UNHCR in 1999, she has served in the Office of the Inspector General as an assistant representative focused on protection in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as in Iraq. She's had positions in Turkey and Egypt. And prior to UNHCR, Carolyn was a refugee officer in the U.S. Department of uh, Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, uh, at, based at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. She was an editor for the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt and also for the International Council of Museums in Egypt. Our second panelist is Nirvana Shaw'i, who is the Regional Director for CARES Middle East and North Africa region. Nirvana has two decades of experience working in the Middle East in multiple roles, 
from academia and media to advocacy and campaigning. Nirvana has served as regional director of care since 2018, overseeing programming across 11 countries with a dual mandate in both humanitarian response and development. Before joining CARE, Nirvana worked with Crisis Action in multiple positions, and most recently as International Partnerships and Mika Director. As a regional expert on advocacy and conflict, she has led global efforts to protect civilians in humanitarian crises in the Middle East, including advocacy on emergencies in Lebanon, Libya, Palestine, Syria, Western Sahara, and Su Sudan, and Yemen. Before that, Nirvana had a distinguished career in journalism, working, worked also as a researcher for Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies, and also as an academic lecturer. And our final panelist today is Lina Al Zabi, who earned a master's degree in English literature from Al Zaytuna University of Jordan and a professional diploma in refugee and forced migration studies from the University of Jordan. She held a diploma as well well in social work with a focus on refugees and migrants from the German Jordanian University. And she's currently pursuing a PhD in English literature at Karabuk University in Turkey. Since 2015, Lina has been involved in a variety of volunteer initiatives with refugees in Jordan and collaborates with a number of non-governmental organizations. And recently she launched a social initiative called Hopes Beyond Borders, Refugees Unheard Voices, in a bid to provide every refugee with an online platform to make his or her voice heard. So just a reminder, we're going to have a conversation as a panel for the next 40 minutes or so. To our audience, if you'd like to pose any questions, please, please put them in the Q&A, and we will allocate some time towards the end of the session to answering your questions. So let's begin with, with Carolyn. Um, Carolyn, can you help us um, set the context for this question and really uh, take a look at the region and give us your an analysis uh, sitting uh, from the perspective of UNHCR and what the current livelihoods context looks like for certain uh, refugee women in the MENA region and how UNHCR really uh, looks at the needs um, potential and the barriers uh, for economic inclusion of, of Syrian refugee women. Well, thank you so much, um, Manette, for the excellent introduction, um, and also for including UNHCR in, in, this, in this panel. Um, the region is still home to the largest refugee crisis in the world, um, and UNHCR, UNDP, are working with more than 270 partners to try to address the needs of approximately 7.1 million refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless persons, including 5.6 million registered Syrian refugees in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. Um, so we work closely with partners throughout this response. And let's just take a minute to reflect that behind these numbers are people who've been forced to flee, and thus we call them refugees. Um, and in the midst of this situation, um, women, everyone has specific needs, but particularly women and children and the very, very high number of, of youth. Um, we recognize that host countries face enormous pressures at a level not seen since the onset of the crisis um, because of COVID. The three RP countries, the ones I just mentioned, continue to face um, varying degrees of socioeconomic crises exacerbated by COVID-19, and in some cases coupled with political crises. Um, the, since the establishment of this response mechanism, um, particularly amongst the host community members, the number of people in need has approximately doubled since before the COVID-19 pandemic due to the socioeconomic impact and increasing vulnerabilities. And this is the area in which refugees, women, Syrian refugee women, are trying to support themselves and their families. So on the big strategic level, yes, we have the numbers, the registration, the partners, um, and we've tried, to, we do as a protection agency have a 
a strategy developed with our partners that's really grounded in international refugee law in the principles of the Global Compact on Refugees and which speaks to the Jordan Compact. And within this big framework, we try to have programs that are set up to really support both refugees and host communities to support social cohesion and really try to foster the resilience and the capacity of refugee, Syrian refugee women and all of the other people who've been impacted. The specific areas that we've highlighted as challenges to be overcome, the recessions, the rising levels of unemployment and poverty, worsened inequalities, particularly putting the vulnerable population groups back. We had a lot of people, especially in Jordan, who were almost managing, but after COVID, they're back into extreme poverty. Uh, food insecurity, increased dependency on what is still unfortunately limited humanitarian assistance. This has led to evictions, higher debt, income losses, coupled with the absence or limited capacity of social well, safety nets in most of the countries that we're looking at. This has also brought on uh, increased mental health, a whole variety of serious protection issues, which lead to what we call negative coping, negative coping mechanisms, which place far more burdens on the refugee women that we're talking about. So we have a whole range of strategies to try to support resilience in the community with our partners. Um, we provide cash assistance, we provide training, and we also try to really highlight the capacity and potential of the refugee population, particularly the women. Um, but we also have to note the social constructs, which often make it difficult for refugee women to go out and work. This is often a new role, particularly for Syrian women here coming from Dara, where they were not necessarily working before, um, and even social constraints against working. More and more refugee women have started to work. And um, what I'd like to really emphasize is that we're trying to help people to become self-reliant, but we have so many really talented women, um, a lot of potential, a lot of skills who want to make contributions um, qualified architects, teachers, people qualified in um, law and medicine, and a lot of women who are also um, working in the, in the less skilled areas. And we're trying to really leverage opportunities in each country where we work to target refugee women and really support the refugees and affected populations as a whole. Thank you, that's, that's just very helpful and sobering sort of foundation for the discussion. You alluded to the Jordan Compact um, and we've discussed the, 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 the Global Compact on Refugees as well. Could you talk a little bit more about what the sort of broader policy commitments are at the global and the regional level that UNHCR uses to sort of frame its work on behalf of refugees? Um, well, let's see, at the Jordan level, Yes, across the board, in the context of the global compact on refugees. Um, so let's look regionally first at the Global Refugee Forum. States and other stakeholders submitted pledges to foster inclusive economic growth for refugees and host communities through decent work, job creation and entrepreneurship programs. Um, of the total of 140 pledges, 40 are reported in progress and planning are already fulfilled. So globally and in the region, we're really trying to support access to decent work for refugees and for the vulnerable host communities. And obviously, because of their vulnerability, um, we are really looking very closely at, at women. Um, and then when we come to the Jordan Compact, this was a really forward-looking initiative, and we've seen a steady improvement in the rate of issuance of work permits and the access, and access to decent work and a new development in Jordan, um, the Social Security Corporation through which refugees can actually pay into a fund which will provide some protection. And if they become unemployed, they should actually get some protection rather than going back to depending on cash-based interventions. Very interesting. Thank you. And just uh, perhaps to, to round out um, your initial comments, could you give us um, 
just a flavor of what UNHCR's programming on the ground looks like? Are there one or two sort of emblematic initiatives that, that you hold up as um, what you would like to do more of in the livelihood space for, for refugee women? This is actually really exciting and we're really proud of it. Um, I think maybe the most emblematic one is the groups of women plumbers who were working in Zahtari. This is an Un, this is an unconventional, non-traditional area where there's a huge demand. Um, but we have identified uh, young women, qualified architects. There are um, refugee UN volunteers um, working as engineers. And we've had refugee contributions, including as healthcare professionals who contributed to the Jordanian government's response during the COVID ep epidemic, pandemic. And this is something where we really welcomed the government's inclusive approach to including everyone in their territory in their COVID response. And at the same time, we were really proud that there were highly qualified medical professionals who were refugees, who also participated in and were employed by the Ministry of, of Health. Um, but across the board, we've been trying to support women in home-based businesses because many particularly Syrian refugee women, are more comfortable in these areas. And we're also trying to look at ways to strengthen women's empowerment and look at the challenges that confront both refugee and Jordanian women, difficulties in transport um, and problems with sexual harassment, which of course is something that's very hard for people to report and talk about, but is a reality. And so we're really trying to support, you know, this very promising and energetic population that is eager to work and contribute. So we're trying to look with our partners at as many different entry points as possible, both for the less skilled and also for the more highly skilled refugees. And if I can just mention the um, Global Compact on Refugees, our commitment to support um, governments who host refugees, but also to look for more places for resettlement and complementary pathways, because these again provide opportunities for refugee women and girls, amongst others. Great. Really, really encouraging and interesting initiatives. Thank you so much, Carolyn. If I might, I will move to Nirvana now. And um, Nirvana, welcome. Um, ask you perhaps to reflect a little bit on what CARE has been doing through its programming uh, to enhance women's workforce participation in the MENA region, Syrian refugee women's participation in the MENA region? What strategies have you used? Um, what sectors are you targeting through your work? Um, and, um, and really, if you can, what does success mean and look like for you? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Monette. And thank you so much um, to Columbia Global Center for this I mean, um, workshop and this partnership. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you today. Um, can you just confirm that you can hear me well? Because, I mean, the voice Perfect. was shaky. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, allow me to start by, 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 by stating that CARE actually has been working on, I mean, um, in uh, and on um, the Syrian crisis since the beginning of the crisis. And it's been really an uphill um, journey for CARE, giving, I mean, the the fact that it is the crisis of our generation, and especially here in the Middle East, this has been actually one of the defining um, um, shifts for our programming um, after m many years of mostly focusing on our development work um, in the Middle East, giving, I mean, um, uh, the nature of the needs we had in the region, we had to really shift our gear very, very rapidly uh, when the crises um, took um, the uphill and we had to really shift towards a more dual approach focused on both humanitarian response in addition to long-term um, uh, engagements. And the conflict, as you all know, I mean, I, 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 I assume that some of the I mean, facts and figures I'll be sharing are, are already known to a lot of people on this uh, webinar, but some of them are also particular to uh, CARES work. So that, as we all know, the conflict in Syria has displaced 12 million people and more than 65% of the population are, I mean, currently in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, allow me to start, I mean, uh, by a quote 
from a Syrian woman who lives in northeast Syria after being displaced, who she says, and I quote, life is mentally and physically exhausting. We can no longer go to hospitals because healthcare and medicines are so expensive. My children eat less. They no longer have milk because I had to sell my cows and we no longer eat vegetables because they are expensive, end of quote. Um, we as CARE have interviewed this woman as part of the rapid gender assessment analysis um, that, I mean, CARE is very known for. And we had to do one before the Ukrainian crisis. And it was actually um, um, uh, collated in a report. And this report shows how families have had to reduce their food consumptions. And one um, in five children faces malnutrition in North, northern Syria. And I'm sure if we meet this woman again, she will tell us we can no longer eat bread today because of the uh, Ukrainian crisis. Um, CARE has been working in the Middle East and North Africa since 1948. And actually, when we say MENA for CARE, it also includes Eastern Europe. So we are working in the Caucasus and the Balkans and now working also in, I mean, on the Ukrainian crisis. And the region is home to the world's most and worst humanitarian and refugee crisis in, uh, in the world. Our program delivers emergency aid as well as uh, longer term support, uh, working through partners and with direct action as well. And we focus on strengthening people's resilience, supporting them to absorb and adapt to recurring shocks and stresses. And our expertise lies in gender uh, responsive emergency response, food security and livelihoods, uh, water, sanitation and hygiene support, women's economic empowerment, as well as protection of vulnerable groups with a specific focus on women and girls across our programs in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, and also inside Syria. And I mean, um, to answer you, Monette, around the strategies we have um, used, um, CARE delivers emergency assistance as well as longer term support. And we believe that emergency and humanitarian aid should be complemented with development work and objectives. And so, using a resilience building approach embedded in uh, value chain programming that is integrated across sectors and provided alongside emergency assistance is fundamental to care success. Um, we help Syrian women and vulnerable families to become economically empowered and self-reliant. And we prioritize the most vulnerable households based on size and assets and income and um, gender and their risk to gender-based violence, uh, disability and age, and, um, and we build community accountability around that. And care um, support includes training, uh, job placement, such as apprenticeships, uh, awareness campaigns, promoting fair business practices, and prioritizing, and I'm so sorry, I mean, uh, sometimes the English words uh, get, get very difficult to uh, pronounce. It's prioritizing value chains that enhance linkages between producers and buyers. And the sectors we target are actually uh, four key sectors um, uh, because, I mean, there are four gender and livelihood tre uh, trends and relevant sectors that we are focusing on across the region. We start with the gendered impact and the crisis in Syria, of course, continues to have a gendered impact with women and adolescent girls paying a high price uh, due to the harmful and discriminatory gender norms and uh, prevailing and widespread gender-based violence, including early and forced marriages. And the economic and psychological stresses are driving an increase in domestic violence as, I mean, um, as most of the uh, data tells us. There is also, I mean, a focus on nutritional deficiencies where 60% of people in Northern Syria report reducing their food intake to ensure their children are fed and people compromise the quality of food unable and, una and are unable to buy uh, vegetables or even basic oils. Um, the third focus is the changing role of Syrian women as breadwinners. And 
Um, since the beginning of the conflict, many men, of course, have died and disappeared and have been forced to migrate or have been injured during the war. And this has resulted in 22% of the Syrian households are now headed by women. Not only do women bear uh, the burden of household, uh, household uh, responsibilities, but they also have an additional role to play that of the uh, providers. Um, and the final focus is the distress and feeling of insecurity, which, I mean, um, in CARE's recent annual needs assessment of conditions in Jordan that you have all already, I mean, uh, have received copies from it. It demonstrates the severe distress among thousands of refugees and vulnerable Jordanian families interviewed across the, uh, the country. As we've seen over the last two years, particularly the economic stress and the impact of the pandemic are driving an increase in violence against women and children, even with more women uh, taking up the role of providing their to, for their families. Uh, few women have any control over how their earnings are spent. And compared to last year, the number of respondents uh, facing verbal and emotional violence at home has risen by more than 30% with reports of gender-based violence having also increased. Um, to answer the last part of your question about what does uh, success look like for us and what are the some emblematic projects that, uh, that we are, I mean, um, focusing on, um, CARE is currently actually piloting innovative approaches that support more inclusive communities and marketplaces. And we are testing new approaches to inclusive livelihoods with a particular focus on women and persons with disabilities. Um, our projects uh, support people to restart their livelihoods and protect existing produ uh, productive assets, which are vital in increasing the capacity to absorb new shocks. And CARE provides uh, vulnerable men and women and persons with disabilities and marginalized groups as well with access to livelihoods, uh, inputs such as uh, fodder and certified seeds and fertilizers uh, um, and vaccinations and even tools. And um, we try and care to build skills in agricultural production, particularly including using the farmer field school approach to train farmers or herders in techniques to improve the quality and quantity of the food they produce uh, using less resources. And this is critical given the recurring issue of water shortages and drought in Syria. And um, this training support cover, uh, covers and covers both plant-based and lively stock agricultural value chains, including uh, climate smart agriculture and, and veterinary uh, skills and fodder production and biogas production. And furthermore, we actually focus also on cash for work opportunities, uh, which both provide vulnerable people with temporary income and help restore uh, uh, essential infrastructure upon which the entire community relies. And um, the entrepreneurs receive grants or inputs to start or expand small and medium scale um, businesses. And finally, uh, many of our projects across the region also focused on the gendered impact of the shifting social norms by increasing um, uh, engagement of men and boys in psychological support and gender-based violence prevention and response and these strategies to increase women, uh, women's voice in the public sphere, uh, in the household, as well as in community decision-making. Very interesting. Thank you, Nirvana. Uh, in fact, your, your last point takes me into the, the direction I wanted to go in my next question, but perhaps briefly, if you don't mind, can you talk a little bit about um, what you're doing to address some of the barriers to um, more, more active engagement of women in the workspace? Um, you talk there about one strategy, which is engaging men uh, as a way of sort of um, impacting gender norms and perceptions. Um, perhaps you could talk about one or two other barriers and how you're approaching them through your engagement or your advocacy. 
Sure, thank you. Thank you, Monette. Actually, I mean, our approach to include uh, men and boys has started since the Balkan Wars, and this has been really, I mean, um, a big a big shift in gender programming globally to focus really not just on, on one side uh, in the community, but actually to have a balanced approach of the engagement. And I mean, to focus on your question, um, sustainable and longer term funding is a major constraint on our programming, um, as you can imagine. We therefore need uh, increased humanitarian funding for the, uh, for the Syria crisis across the MENA region that co-currently support life-saving interventions and early recovery and resilience programming. And I think that that, that folk, I mean, looking at the, human, uh, the humanitarian regional uh, response, um, um, the sufficiently the funding of the forthcoming two year for the HRP with a balanced approach to funding activities across the three pillars, including uh, redoubling efforts to increase, inc increase funding for multi-purpose cash assistance, uh, will enable individuals and households prioritize the needs they would uh, like to address. And uh, the, other, the other big constraint or burden is actually in Syria. About 70% of people working on farms are women, and many of them are the main breadwinners in their families, as men uh, I, I mentioned are injured and deceased uh, or missing. And without water, there are no corps. And without corp, I mean, without corps, uh, crops, sorry, there is no income and there is a decreased availability of food, which means that a lot of women and their children are spiraling deeper into both hunger and poverty. And, and there is, I mean, um, there is no time to waste because the situation demands that authorities in the region and the governments would act now to save um, these uh, lives. Thank you. Thank you, Nirvana. We, we will definitely circle back to some of these themes. Um, but I'd like to move on to Lena uh, now. Lena, welcome. Um, I'd like to turn to you. I mean, um, you know, as a, a Syrian woman yourself and someone who's worked, I know, extensively in Jordan in particular uh, with uh, refugee populations. Could you share some reflections on how you feel um, from what you've heard, what, how Syrian women themselves reflect on the livelihoods issue um, and what some of their aspirations might be in this space? Okay, thank you, Manas, for the invitation being one of the panelists. Uh, thanks for also the introduction. Um, basically, last year it was a heavy uh, work with the refugees in general, and particularly with the, uh, I found that uh, especially uh, separated women and widows are, as the marginalized, uh, uh, mostly. Uh, I, to talk, start with the, the Human Rights Watch said like in a report, life like death for uh, Syrians, 90% um, of uh, Syrian refugees who live in the uh, extreme poverty uh, for they rely on um, uh, debt or borrowing uh, just to survive. So Syrian women in the country of uh, neighboring uh, Syria, they live um, in very difficult uh, financially. Uh, basically, uh, the, because of the loss or the absence of the breadwinner uh, during the war, which um, they are basically, uh, according to the tradition, as a, a Syrian, one of them, um, the breadwinner used to be the male figure in the family. So the the absence or the, the loss of um, uh, the breadwinner uh, make it very difficult for them. Also, the decrease of the job opportunities, uh, which intensified during the corona uh, pandemic, all of that uh, increased uh, for uh, Syrian refugees and uh, women particularly, who are uh, uh, especially the breadwinner and their families increased the poverty rate. Also, um, women, uh, as I met them, uh, they view the uh, livelihood aspects uh, for them as one of the difficult uh, situation. Uh, they believe it will uh, be worsened in the future, um, especially with the decrease of the support that uh, was provided to them by the response uh, plan for Syrian refugees in the host countries. Um, 
they view uh, like uh, better livelihoods or the access to formal work um, to support themselves basically and their families in turn. Uh, this is was uh, one of the foundation for uh, the empowerment for them and the uh, also uh, the integration, the, the equality with uh, people in the uh, host countries. So they tried to find ways to support themselves uh, by finding economic opportunities, uh, but in a long term uh, to make or to support uh, sustainable uh, livelihoods uh, for them and their families and even the uh, integration in host countries. So this necessity uh, required uh, women uh, to transgress, as uh, Nirvana said, uh, the traditional norms, uh, gender norms uh, they used to live on, and to go uh, beyond the private uh, domain to seek, uh, like for aid services, for example, or uh, informal work uh, in the host country to support their families. So they desire to work uh, to uh, to sustain a, a, a respectful livelihood for them and their families, but uh, the increased uh, responsibilities uh, with the, uh, within their households uh, uh, put them uh, into a higher risk of, of um, sometimes verbal, uh, sexual, uh, and even physical violence, uh, especially the ones um, uh, as I mentioned, the marginalized, like uh, separated women or uh, widows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, your second part of the question and their aspiration uh, for uh, the works. Um, um, uh, mostly uh, the works um, um, for the refugees, uh, they are targeted the uh, male dominate, let, uh, let me say it like that. Uh, it's uh, not available for uh, more traditional female occupations uh, or sectors. So uh, the uh, works uh, opportunities tend to be like uh, agriculture, uh, domestic and textile appear to be uh, um, with, with, for women without uh, needing even uh, the permits. So, um, uh, their aspiration for a paid uh, uh, works, uh, they try to find uh, uh, a providing uh, legal and social uh, protection so that they can work uh, uh, without any restriction, without any securities. Uh, also, they can um, build a livelihood uh, support. Uh, they can find the programs that they can support them and address uh, the barriers for their jobs. Uh, also, they aspire to find uh, a, a temporary jobs, uh, opportunities, um, maybe through the community projects or the trading, uh, the leadership training. Uh, um, uh, the paid job could also uh, offer them a respectful life that they can uh, live easily with their families and uh, without fe being feeling uh, insecure as most of the uh, women I, I uh, interviewed, they were, uh, uh, it was reflected on them uh, psychologically, even socially and from the financial uh, uh, situations also. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina. That's, um, that's an important perspective to add to our discussion today. And, uh, I'd like to open it up to, to the whole panel, actually. I mean, one of the, we've been focusing largely on um, formal avenues uh, for work um, and the reality for refugees in general, uh, but also for, for women is that what often will be most available is work in the informal sector. And I'd be interested in hearing um, sort of your, your reflections on how to engage with that aspect of the labor force, because there the sort of aspiration of work and work with dignity is particularly challenging um, to, to ensure, uh, you know, given the enhanced vulnerability that sometimes exists in the informal sector. So I'd be interested in hearing about any initiatives um, either from HCR or CARE uh, around the, the informal sector. Carolyn, absolutely. Jump yes, um, one of the 
things that we do that's really important and I also really enjoy is we meet um, with refugee communities all over the country constantly and they come and they talk about their problems and they're frequently not the problems you expect. People will come and talk about the low wages in the informal sector and so we can talk to them about how that's exploitation and what they can actually do about it and and really try to support them. Um, we also just listen to the refugee women regularly. And um, one factory was frequently factories advertised for women aged 18 to 30. And so we've discovered this like ageism in access to employment and women who are in their 30s and 40s tell me, we want to learn coding. We want to be eligible for these factory jobs. Our kids are grown up or they're in school and we don't have little kids at home who need babysitters, whereas the women in the younger age group actually have more trouble getting babysitters. So there are a lot of ways whereby listening to the community about um, wages, transport, access, job requirements, we can just find some quick, quick solutions. So those were two that, that sprung to mind from discussions in the last year or so. Really, really important. Uh, Nirvana, I love how polite you're all being with the hand. You can also- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to, I mean, jam, jam the screen. Um, um, thank you. I mean, Caroline, you, you have actually raised very, very important examples. And I think that, I mean, looking at the informal sector um, and, and women doing jobs that were previously held by men um, carries increased risk and fewer protections. And this is really one of the key that we try to look at from CARE's perspective, I mean, um, in our livelihood focus, um, especially that women are becoming now primarily responsible for the resilience of their families and communities in all aspects of their lives and have also gained new decision-making power, confidence and independence along the way. Um, I mean, one, of, one, one, one quote I would like to share with you uh, as, I mean, one of, um, one of the displaced women in, in northern Syria told us, and I quote, these new circumstances have put me in the position of being both mother and father for my children. And this applies to most women in my community. Um, the current situation has led uh, to women's empowerment. And of course, I mean, with, uh, with, with quotations and perceptions that we are now more equal to men, but the reality is that we took on the role of both males and females simultaneously, and now we do both jobs, end of quote. And I think that, that it is important to focus that the emerging role of women as breadwinners has meant that the overall shortage in, of funding for humanitarian assistance and failure to support the essential uh, multi-year resilience and recovery initiatives have uh, a disproportionately negative impact on women as it affects the ability of families to access the basic necessities for survival and should jeopardizes the fragile yet potentially transformational changes in the authority and independence of women within their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, Lina, I take it, you, do you wanna jump in? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, when I uh, interviewed the uh, Syrian women, uh, Syrian women, uh, I, there was uh, uh, like a discrepancy between what they say the women who uh, has a family as a female breadwinner and the families, uh, the women who are responsible for their families. Uh, uh, the the shifting rule and the double responsibilities uh, that they had to. Uh, uh, supply for their family, offer them uh, what they need for making uh, a good livelihood, uh, to be honest, affected them uh, a lot, especially the mother. So I think uh, having more attention or uh, taking their situation uh, more into account by the uh, organizations or the uh, um, the different institutes, uh, not only from the uh, psychological or the social uh, perspective, but also from the financial uh, side uh, I think will uh, um, not only affect her uh, as a person or as an individual, but also the whole family. Uh, I, I think this will uh, decrease the pressure uh, on her um, uh, from different levels. Absolutely. 
I can see the questions coming in quite fast in the Q&A box, which is great. Um, Nirvana, I see your ha hand went up. Do you have a final reflection on this particular question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to actually, because I mean, most of most of my examples, I mean, um, were, 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 were focused on, on, on Inside Syria. And I wanted to just give you a quick example, I mean, um, as part of also the refugee response from our uh, work in Turkey, because we, for example, I mean, focusing on both the barriers facing uh, women um, Syrian refugees in Turkey, but also, I mean, I mean, the solutions we have, we have, I mean, uh, provided to overcome these barriers is that we have negotiated with Turkey's um, largest and uh, most widespread bank to allow Syrian women to open bank accounts where they can save their money and have the required paperwork to grow, to grow their businesses. Um, we have also worked with the garment and the agriculture sector companies that can work with Syrian um, women on skill development in um, interning with the with these private companies and being part of the former productive cycle um, in the country. So I I all I mean I own I know that I've I've been trying to focus on on the challenges, but I also wanted to highlight some of the positive examples as well. Thank you, Manat. That's great. Thank you. One final question from my side before I take the Q and A uh, questions. Um, a number of you alluded in your remarks to the importance of transportation as a key facilitator of, uh, you know, women's ability to, to engage in the workforce. Um, obviously, transportation is bigger than any livelihoods portfolio or even refugee protection portfolio. So I, I, I wondered whether any of you would care to share some strategies that are probably multi-sectoral that um, allow you to tackle this particular aspect um, of the of the of the challenge that women face to more meaningfully sort of engage in work, I'm happy to throw it open to anyone. Um, Carolyn, yeah, um, it's a, it's huge just because of well, it's the safety, it's the cost and the safety for women in general, but especially for Syrian refugee women. Uh, so there are some garment uh, factories that actually provide buses that, that take women in um, but and some employers will actually provide money for transportation but having safe transportation where women won't be subject to harassment and where daughters can go and um, and get to work and then not you know face the shame of being harassed and having their families finding out it's a huge challenge added to the you know the, the challenge of transport in general in Amman is a huge city and we have a map of where most refugees are and the highest concentration are actually in um in Amman and some refugees will actually try to you know live on the farms where they work in tents and that's illegal so safe transport for women is really really key allowances for transport and buses provided by larger employers are the best coping mechanisms that we've seen so far but it continues to be a huge um, a huge challenge great thank you very helpful so I'm going to move to some of the questions in the Q&A uh, box here. And I, I see looking at them that there are a couple that come back to this question of working in the informal economy. Um, so th th there are three questions that I think sort of resonate with each other. One is, what is being done to advocate for refugees who are not who are working, they're not legally allowed to work uh, in places like Jordan? So outside of the work permit system, again, uh, likely in a position of, of some vulnerability because of their engagement in the uh, informal workspace. So what's being done to advocate for those refugees? That is one question. A second one um, that I would like to roll into that is, well, how do you support women in the informal economy uh, other than conducting FGDs? Are there any concrete solution examples? Um, and I think, you know, we started to hear some of that from Carolyn in terms of, you know, the sort of clinic-like atmosphere of talking with refugees about some of the challenges they're encountering in the workspace and alerting them to what is exploitation. But perhaps you can build out um, some of the other services that might come with um, supporting women in the informal sector. Um, and then let me just see, there was another one. Uh, 
that related to the informal economy? Well, there is, there is one um, that relates to flexible work permits and what impact they've had um, and what the obstacles might be to issuing these work permits. So I'm gonna cluster those three, um, uh, which broadly speaking, I think address um, you know, the, 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 the constraints of formal work and the challenges of informal work and see if any of our panelists would like to respond. Perhaps Carolyn, I could come to you sure. first because yeah. you can talk about, you know, describing situations of exploitation. Mm -hmm. How would you go beyond that in the work that you do with, um, with women? Well, let's maybe go back to um, the improvement in the management um, by the government and the ILO and Partners and Refugees of the uh, now flexible work permits, a total of 288,876 work permits have been issued, 271,250 to men, 17,626 to women. And since 2020, the Ministry of Labour announced the list of occupations allowed to non-Jordanian workers by economic activity um, and allowed issuance of flexible work permits for these occupations. So once you have the work permit, you can go out and have several different jobs with it. So the environment is, is certainly being improved. The informal job market is definitely a challenge. And um, we can try to counsel refugees regarding the best approach would be to have a work permit. And then you actually will have something like a contract with your employer and try to have decent conditions working with um, a range of factories and employers who do seek out particularly Syrian women as employees. So that's those are all positive steps that can be taken. Regarding the informal market, I think I won't go into that because this would impact both, I think, Jordanians and Syrians, people who work informally. Um, that's maybe outside the scope of what I can comment on. And then obviously there's people who have work permits that they've applied for as a migrant worker, and it's quite complicated, if not impossible, sometimes for refugees to um, obtain these work permits for, for non-Syrian refugees. This is challenging and something where we are working closely with the government to minimize protection risks to refugees and to really um, you know, promote refugees having the permission to work that's required for any foreign worker in, in Jordan. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think the, the, the size of the informal sector in many of the countries in, in, in the MENA region, you know, points to some, some common vulnerabilities and areas where I think strategies that do focus on both hosts and refugees can, can be really quite productive. Um, Lino or Nirvana, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yes. If, uh... mm -hmm. Okay, uh, related to Jordan, I think, starting from 2018, they uh, issue work permits for uh, home-based uh, business yeah. uh, so that it can be uh, legally to work. Uh, I think this gives uh, a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, families to work legally, although most of them uh, used to work, uh, uh, let me call it in, in such an illegal way. However, they uh, were, for, uh, were fa faced uh, different of um, uh, situations that they uh, were exploited or uh, uh, were exploited. And uh, by uh, turning it to a legal way uh, uh, with permits, I think this is ensure them a safety uh, and the protection and gaining most of their uh, rights. Even this will be a, a more productive for the countries that uh, they reside in also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take a couple more questions if you don't have anything to add, Nirvana. Oh, no, I actually no. I was yeah. I was I was actually struggling to uh, to unmute uh, to find the unmute button. But I mean, I think that that that, that I, I I I mean, I wouldn't actually try to repeat what Caroline and Lena have already covered very eloquently. But I I think that looking at how can we effectively 
I mean, um, include, um, I mean, um, refugee, I mean, women and and uh, and men, of course, in the policy making processes that affect their livelihoods. I think that there are two key approaches that we try to really advocate for. I mean, the first one is actually to, I mean, to call for an investment, uh, a further investment in supporting local capacities, including w- local women's leadership through sharing and supporting capacity that is strengthening of, I mean, national and local, I mean, um, NGOs. I think that this is really important and key to ensure that they are best equipped to engage meaningfully and effectively in the humanitarian response. And this actually really opens the door for multiple, multiple, I mean, um, avenues for engagement, I mean, on, on, um, on a livelihood I mean, uh, front. And of course, the national and local partners have power in relation to the local context and with the deep knowledge um, of the communities, they are often, often better placed um, to advocate and, and to, I mean, um, uh, respond for uh, the needs. The, the other piece is actually really related to um, the, the prioritization of national and local um, uh, NGOs um, and organizations in the participation of the advocacy and, uh, and, and letting them really lead the agenda. Because I think that one of the key pieces in advocating, for example, with national governments as the Jordanian government, as the Turkish government, as the Lebanese governments, I mean, there is, there is so much, I mean, um, different weight that, that the local organizations bring when they are advocating for better inclusion for refugees and better inclusion for, I mean, um, fair uh, and open opportunities for for ensuring, I mean, livelihoods uh, for refugees. And I think that one of the key pieces, and I know that, 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 that I mean, again, I'm advocating to, I mean, to, to my peers is that, I mean, w- what we need to really be calling for is the donors to ensure that the national and the local organizations can really engage in influencing structures and seeking the change at the level of uh, policy and legal frameworks or social norms to ensure that both um, the most urgent needs and the long lasting challenges are addressed. And we have great examples from the last, I mean, decade working on the Syria crisis where, where really the national and the local, I mean, um, uh, partners have led a lot of the efforts to 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 um, to for better integration and for better actually, I mean, um, working conditions for uh, for for Syrian refugees. And I think that this is really, I think, the recipe for success moving forward. Thank you. Caroline. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to jump back in again, but I think uh, the work that we do with the UN country team supporting the government in its work towards the 2030 goals and the strategic development goals, leaving no one behind and the right to decent work and including refugees in this, this type of initiative. I think that's also critical at the very, very strategic level. That was just my additional comment. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Well, in fact, we have an extensive uh, question coming up on refugee inclusion, but I'm going to leave that to last. There is a, a quite specific question here about how would the panelists assess the contribution of cash for work projects for building Syrian women's resilience? Um, do in any of your experience stretch to the cash for work project? No, maybe that's one thing we can take. Uh, oh, Carolyn, absolutely. We, for it. Um, the question, I mean, is it cash for work or is it cash assistance? It's very different. I, I interpret this as being cash for work. Because multi-purpose cash is a fantastic way for everyone across the board to to support refugees, and um, cash for work is just one component of cash-based interventions, which are really effective ways of protecting vulnerable women and even supporting them while they get trained so that they can get a job. So, just to to emphasize, I think the importance of of, of cash-based assistance. Um, we've dispersed we dispersed to 32,000 families per month every year. Um, We dispersed over 5 million um, US dollars in February alone. And it's a really important aspect of of protection. And cash for work is one part of the full range of cash-based interventions which are carried out um, by by 
partners at many, many different levels. So just wanted to emphasize that. I think one of, was one of the strategies that is uh, training the uh, participants as women, for example, uh, on different skills that the program uh, targeted. Uh, then uh, seeing the the project's proposals and what is uh, successful and uh, useful for them, and then giving them the money, uh, waiting for a few months to see how, uh, how is it is it successful or not. I think this is one of the assessments for that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to come to, to a question that we've, we've been talking around quite a bit, but it's posed by someone in our audience, so they want to hear more. Um, can you please share with us your experience and thoughts on women's perceptions on work? What trends or common education and skills Syrian women possessed before the crisis compared to what they've acquired after the crisis? And then finally, how do you engage women in your programming? Um, which I think we've, we've been talking about quite a bit, but another opportunity perhaps for you all to reflect on how important this is and what you're doing. How do you engage women in your programming in response to the evolving needs and addressing some of these barriers? So happy to take whoever would like to go first. Carolyn, I love it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, and please make me wait, you know, I, I, um, but I'm really excited about this because we, we have so many different ways of involving women in our programming. And every year, every quarter, we have focus group discussions with men, women, girls, boys, we have a series of questions, and we ask them for feedback. So we, we don't plan anything without going to the community, to the community outreach centers, and listening to what well, in this case, what women want. We try to get feedback from everyone, but it's absolutely core. And I think it's part of the IASC guidelines to all of us working in a humanitarian setting that all of our programs are based on planning with the community. And it's built into our results-based framework and our um, planning, which is based on the strategic development goals, among others, and listening to the refugees. And very often, we the answers we get are not the answers that we've been expecting. And so we sit down, we discuss, we ask women what they want, and then we build our programming around what refugees want and how much money we have, of course. Thank you. Nirvana. Yes, I mean, thank you. I mean, this is this is really a big question, and I, I think that it requires actually, I mean, a workshop on its on its own to really, I mean, um, look at, I mean, women's perception to work and how it has actually evolved with uh, with with the crisis. And I, I, I mean, I can actually give you one uh, one example from uh, our annual needs assessment in Jordan, um, where employment across genders and nationalities declined in 2021, even with the reopening uh, of the Jordanian economy and um, the high uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates. And only actually 41% of those interviewed had jobs with Iraqi refugees uh, be uh, bearing the burnt of unemployment. And um, among Syrian refugees, less than quarter, around 22%, had work permits, as Caroline was saying, which is the lowest rate recorded in two years. And the unease among families is also heightened by the constant threat of homelessness, um, where more than half of the households surveyed uh, said that they fear uh, eviction. And, and that fear has left them feeling unsafe uh, at home. And for many Syrian families living outside the camps where rent constitutes over half their monthly income, if not more, um, leaving them with little food um, and other necessities is what, I mean, um, they managed to, uh, to get by with um, their, their, their income after paying for rent. And I mean, um, they, have, they have really been, I mean, looking for different solutions. But the problem, I think, 
um, I think that the, I mean, that can be quoted in, in, in one of the quotes of the respondents for this, uh, for this annual assessment, which was saying, and I quote, without jobs or savings um, to fall back on, families live in perpetual fear of having their landlords turn them out uh, or their water or electricity being cut off. And I think that this actually is a constant solution, as is a constant problem that requires really, I mean, again, a very, a very comprehensive approach to address it and 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 not only to deal with it from, from one angle. And this is what we try to do in care, um, I mean, as, as we engage um, in the Syrian crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm conscious of time and we're coming up against um, you know, the culmination of this, this conversation, but I'd like um, to throw you a question, um, which is, you know, we've heard some, some wonderful initiatives here and really comprehensive thinking <clears throat> about the, the, the scale of the problem, the needs and some really innovative strategies to tackle um, the need to involve women more in the workforce. Um, I'm conscious that today we're operating in the 11th year of a conflict. We know donors' attention uh, um, And we also have Ukraine, which um, is certainly diverting potentially attention and, and fortunately also resources, although we hope not, um, in the future from this crisis. So, I would like to ask you all if you had to convey, you know, one or two key messages to, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, international community and the donor community here about how to capitalize on all of this important work and how to scale up this work, what would those messages be? Um, and I might start with Lena, if you don't mind. Do you feel ready to go first? It's okay. I hope nobody would go through the situations that uh, most of the Syrians go through, uh, starting from the displacement and the suffering that they go through integration and getting adapted to a new uh, environment. So the basic thing to uh, try to elevate some of the pressures and uh, that any human being can go through, uh, starting from the displacement and try to uh, support them uh, offer them the basic needs that any human being can need and uh, taking into consideration that some people need some special uh, things for uh, their survival it's not a matter of just uh, food and uh, drinking or uh, shelter uh, then we should look uh, uh, to situations uh, uh, and um, see if it's a short term or long term. Uh, as the Syrian crisis, basically most of the, uh, the organizations start to build a, a short term uh, approaches or uh, plans uh, for the Syrian. However, as you can see, we still we now in the 11th year and still discussing uh, the Syrian matter. Uh, uh, we should handle the situation from different perspectives. Is it a short, long, and different needs that uh, uh, people, especially the displaced, need? Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Thank you for being concise. Um, Carolyn, can I go to you next? A brief last thought. Yeah, very briefly, and I think our High Commissioner has said this, and in the context of the Global Compact on Refugees, we really want to urge donors to help to support the countries hosting refugees, which are often the poorest countries. And I mean, he's highlighted their needs in Afghanistan and Ethiopia for Ukrainians, and of course, in the MENA region. And we need really to try to plan in a sustainable strategic way and work more closely with the development actors for greater inclusion to the benefit of both the host communities and the refugees who are being being hosted. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Nirvana, you get the last word. I mean, um, that's, that's the hot seat. So, I mean, and you said concise, so I'll try to be as concise as I can be. I think that, that, that I mean, in, in addition to echoing all, I mean, uh, all the esteemed, I mean, uh, panelists have have highlighted, and all the I mean, points that we, I mean, raised in the discussion. I think that the one 
key message that is important to highlight is that as important as the Ukraine crisis it is, um, we should not forget the Syria crisis and the major humanitarian needs on um, on the ground that are worsening rather than improving with time. I mean, um, with so many forgotten crises around the world, we need to keep our focus on the real needs on the ground in the various MENA countries and I mean Yemen and Somalia and I mean there are, I mean the, the number of 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 crises are are really countless and we really really need to ensure that the international community is does not actually focus its I mean um, their, their 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 attention to I mean um, to the Ukraine crisis on the cost of the other crises which really the responses needs to be happening in parallel. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all for your insights today, for, for sharing with us just the, the real creativity, innovation, and energy that you're bringing to this work, and for sharing with us the very real sort of uh, challenges also that, that remain. And uh, I'd like to thank our wonderful panel. I'd like to thank our, our wonderful audience for the great questions you posed. Please forgive me as chair if I didn't manage to get to all of them. And finally, uh, a, a big thank you to both CARE um, and the Amman Global Center team for, for hosting and convening this conversation today. I'm sure the conversation will continue. In the meantime, take care, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. Bye.